Okay. For those of you at the outside sites that don't know me, my name is Nicole Dodson. I'm a second year internal medicine resident in Kirksville. And I'm going to lecture today on pulmonary function tests. Um, this is not going to be an exhaustive lecture by any means. It's just meant to go through the basics and make all of the numbers look less daunting when you're asked to look at a pulmonary function test um, result sheet. Um, if any of you at the outside sites have questions, feel free to buzz in and ask. Can anybody think of some indications, reasons that you might order pulmonary function tests? What? Shortness of breath. Good. Dyspnea. Wheezing. Wheezing. Evaluate asthma. Yes. Other symptoms? Cough. One more. Do you ever use it to monitor progression? Yes. Progression of disease? Yes. So chest pain is the other symptom. So if you've ruled out cardiac, you can also look at pulmonary as a reason for somebody to have chest pain. Um, someone with risk factors, um, smoking history, exposure to chemicals, um, farm exposure, those types of things. They're having symptoms and they have known risk factors and it's a good idea to get a pulmonary function test. You can use it to evaluate response to treatment to see how well your medications are working. Um, Preoperative evaluation, somebody having thoracic or abdominal surgery, it's a good idea to get a pulmonary function test if they have any respiratory symptoms. And then, as was said, um, see how much their pulmonary function um, is disabling them. Any others? So the method of pulmonary function test in the office is called spirometry and off of the gold website um, defines spirometry as a method of obsessing, assessing lung function by measuring the volume of air that the patient can expel from the lungs after a maximal inspiration. Some values that are obtained from spirometry, uh, FVC, which is the forced vital capacity, FEV1, which is the forced expiratory volume in one second. FVC is the total volume of air that the patient can forcibly exhale, exhale in one breath. FEV1 is the volume of air that the patient is able to exhale in the first second of forced expiration. So from that, you can get your ratio of FEV1 to FVC. This is expressed as a fraction also your FEF 25 to 75, which is forced expiratory flow. This is the average rate of flow over the middle 50% of the FVC. It's just a picture I found of an example of a spirometer like you would have in the office. It's just a small handheld device that the patient exhales into and it's hooked to a laptop. There's usually some sort of a cartoon, so as the patient's exhaling, they can see their effort because the cartoon will change as a incentive to know how well they're doing. I have had one myself and it was a hot air balloon that raised up on the screen as I exhaled. So this would be normal tidal volume, inhalation and exhalation passively. For spirometry, you wanna ask the patient to take a maximal inhalation, which would be up to their total lung capacity at maximal insulation, inhalation, and then you want to ask them to forcibly exhale as fast as they can. So this is called the blast phase. And then after they think that they've exhaled, you tell them to keep going and exhale as long as they can, which would be to the end where only their residual volume would be left in their lungs. Does that make sense to everyone? So there's three basic patterns of spirometry curves, normal, obstructive, and restrictive. So when you do pulmonary function tests, you get a flow volume curve. 
So on the x-axis, you have the lung volume in liters. And if you'll notice, it is decreasing in volume, not increasing. And that's because they're at a maximal inhalation, so a higher number, and then they exhale and it decreases. X-axis is the flow rate. <coughs> so the start of the curve is total lung capacity, a maximum inhalation. The end is at the very end of forced expiration, which is their residual volume. So you expect it to rise and then progressively decline. If you see a concavity, that's indicative of an obstructive disease or more of a convexity, which I've seen descri heard described as a witch's hat, is more consistent with restrictive disease. If you'll notice, the obstructive is moved further this side, so a higher total lung capacity, where restrictive is moved this way down the x-axis for a decreased total lung capacity. Questions about that? No? So what is normal? Uh, normal is based on predicted values. So these are population studies that have been derived for predicted values. Um, patients' age, weight, and height are plugged into a calculation to, to come up with the predictive values for normal. Um, of note, if a patient has severe scoliosis or any other condition where their height is, isn't estimated correctly, then you should use their arm span. If you were to use the height on somebody with severe scoliosis, it would underestimate their lung volume and they give false results. So normal values for FEV1 and FVC are greater than 80% of predicted value. Normal ratio of FEV1 to FVC is between 0.7 and 0.8. Um, something to keep in mind is that FEV1 uh, naturally declines with age, so this needs to be taken into account when interpreting a study for an elderly patient. So a restrictive pattern. FEV1 will be normal or mildly reduced, FVC less than 80% predicted, and the ratio normal or greater than 0.7. Can anyone tell me examples of restrictive lung disease? No. Yes. Good. Others? Good Mm -hmm. Scoliosis. Yes. Burns. Yes. Good. Intrinsic lung diseases such as interstitial lung disease, acute pneumonitis, disorders of the chest wall or pleura, neuromuscular disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, one that I didn't put up here is actually obesity, can cause a restrictive pattern. Obstructive pattern, the FEV1 less than 80% predicted, FVC normal or reduced, and the FEV1 to FVC ratio would be less than 0.7. So what are our obstructive lung diseases? Asthma. There you go. Good job. And? COPD. Exactly. So I put this slide in here just because it has the reversibility. So the way that you differentiate, if you know you have an obstructive pattern, how you differentiate between asthma versus COPD is reversibility. Asthma is reversible, COPD is not. So to be able to test for reversibility, the patient needs to hold their short-acting bronchodilators for six hours before the test, long-acting bronchodilators for 12 hours, and if they're on the theophylline, they need to hold it for 24 hours. So you do spirometry or PFT, then you give them albuterol and wait 10 to 15 minutes and repeat the test and you, you look for a difference. So significant reversibility is defined as an increase in FEV1 of both 200 milliliters and 12% of the FEV1. So it can't be one or the other, it has to be both. Is your 
What? In the ATS technical guidelines for interpreting PFTs, it is or 200 cc's or 12 percent. Okay. So for severity of C COPD, notice the ratio is the same for all the classes, less than 0.7, and then the classes are defined based on FEV1. Mild is greater than 80 percent, moderate 50 to 80, severe 30 to 50, and very severe less than 30. So if you order a full PFT, send the patient to the hospital rather than just doing spirometry in the office, you can obtain some additional values. Vital capacity, residual volume, total lung capacity, and diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide. So this is just to demonstrate tidal volume is where they normally breathe. After maximal inspiration, you get vital capacity. Residual volume is what's left in the lung after vital capacity. And then total lung capacity is the entire volume. Vital capacity is measured by having the patient inhale maximally, then exhale slowly and completely. It can also be called slow vital capacity. Total lung capacity can be calculated by adding the SVC to residual volume. Residual volume, as I've said, is the volume at the end of a complete expiration. You would expect total lung capacity to be increased in an obstructive pattern and decreased in a restrictive pattern. Diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide. This is used to evaluate how much hypoxia the patient has. It's calculated as the area of alveolar capillary membrane times the driving pressure, which is also called the difference in oxygen tension between alveolar gas and venous blood, divided by the thickness of the membrane. This value can be reduced in both restrictive and obstructive disease, but it's a good indicator of severity. I'm going to switch over to the other screen and give some examples. References I used, um, the Gold COPD website, thoracic is ATS, and then up to date. The ATS website has modules for pulmonary function tests if anyone's interested in going through those. And then the guidelines, as, as Dr. Greider said. So this, back up. this patient is a 55-year-old male, presents to the, to the office for hospital follow-up. Uh, a few weeks ago, he was admitted for pneumonia. That was the third hospital admission in 18 months. He has a 60-pack year smoking history. So you order a pulmonary function test for about four to six weeks after hospital discharge, and these are the results that you get. Anyone want to interpret? Southeast. Volunteer? Southeast. Girardo. Okay. Cape Girardo. Okay. Someone from Cape Girardo? Severe COPD, structural disease. Okay, so how do you know that? How did you come to that conclusion? Uh, well, the graph is the graph is concave, showing that it's obstructive, and also the FEV or FVC fraction is below seventy percent, and the FEV one is thirty one, so decreased. That looks like it's severe. What about total lung capacity? That is very high, so that goes with obstructive. Mm hmm. And was there a response to bronchodilator that was significant? 
there is there is a response. Right. So obstruction with reversibility. Good job. So it's asthma, not COPD, right? Yeah. You got 200 cc's and you got your 12%. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Joplin, I'll have you interpret the next one. <laughs> this is a 30-year-old male who presents to the office complaining of decreased exercise tolerance. What do you say? Is that the rest of the question? Yeah, that's it. 30-year-old male presents to the office complaining of decreased exercise tolerance. And this is his PFT result. Okay, so the first vital capacity and the total lung capacity are really small. Yes. So FVC is decreased. FEV1 is decreased. FEV1 to FVC is normal. Total lung capacity is decreased. Diffusing capacity is decreased. So it is a restrictive pattern. Correct. You know he's not just not trying. I can't yeah. See. You gotta. These have to be re reproducible too. And consistent is an average of at least three attempts, not just one go. Right. <coughs> okay, I'll have our audience here interpret the last one. This is a 21 year old female who reports that she's having daily nighttime awakenings with wheezing and cough. She's a college student, and her roommate just got a cat. Volunteer. <laughs> Dr. Clough. Um, Good. Oh, improved. Yeah, so it improved the part of the So most likely the Good. Okay, that was the last one. Does anybody have questions? So it's an, so it's an obstructive pattern. There was a significant response to bronchodilator. So this would be consistent with asthma. No questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you.